Boy, do I ever get comments. I can tell you what right now. The other night, I was doing a video response to the definition of marriage. And boy, did I ever get a lot of comments. Now, the first thing I want to say is that if anybody had ever really bothered to check out my channel, they would have noticed that on my main pe channel page, I have a whole bunch of playlists. Okay? Most of them are very educational playlists. But one thing they will not find is a theology playlist. That's part of it. The other part is that usually when I do a theology video, I don't usually make a, make a big old massive title and I don't put a whole slew of tags down there. And nobody really ever asks why. Well, I'm going to give you the answer. The reason for that is I didn't want theology to become a great big issue on my channel. I want people to be able to come to my channel and watch my educational videos without worrying about my theological standpoints. It's not that I'm ashamed to tell people what I theologically think. Certainly not. I wouldn't make the videos otherwise. It's just I didn't want it to be a major, major issue. I don't want people coming to my channel saying, well, we have to believe what he believes or we're not going to learn anything from him. You can learn what you like from me and you don't have to believe a thing I say. I don't care either way. The idea of Christianity is you're supposed to be distinctive, not force your beliefs on other people. Yes, you have to take a stand. You have to say, I believe this, but you don't pound it into other people's brains. I think that's what happens a lot on these other YouTube channels, is that they are so interested in trying to stuff Christianity down other people's throats so they forget that that's not the way God had it. Jesus came by and he would say whatever and, and he'd walk on. It was up to you whether you believed him or not. Okay. So anyway, let's try to answer some of this. First of all, what's the problem with homosexuality? It's not about what I think of homosexuality. It's what God thinks of homosexuality. That's the key. It's not a matter of what you think or what I think or, any, or Joe Blow down the street thinks. It's what God thinks about it. People just don't notice certain things in the Bible. Take, for instance, the book of Genesis. I can't tell you how many people are going to stand there and say, well, there's another creation story where they were talking about Adam and Lilith. Maybe there is. But it doesn't matter whether there was an Adam and a Lilith or an Adam and an Eve. There's one thing that there is. God did not create a homosexual man for Adam to choose from. He didn't say, hey, look, you got Lilith over there, you got Eve over there, and now you got this homosexual guy. Go ahead, choose. God didn't do it that way. God did not create a homosexual man for Adam to mate with. It didn't happen. More importantly, if we are to go by Genesis chapter 2, verse 23, Genesis 2, verse 23, or 24, sorry, verse 2, chapter 2, verse 24, Therefore a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. His wife. Not his homosexual partner. How can you miss that? As a matter of fact, we have a little town called Sodom and another town right next to it called Gomorrah. And they were committing a lot of sexual sins. A lot more than what people are assuming out of this Bible. Oh, those are just the homosexual towns. Really? I did a video about that, and I successfully proved it wasn't just a homosexual town. These people were practicing homosexuality, polygamy, bestiality. You name it, they were having sex with everything and everyone. Now that became a problem. Because, you see, if it was just a strictly homosexual town, God would not have had to wipe it out. They would have died off of one generation anyway, and God would have just forgotten about them. But they were still having kids in that town. 
And that's true. You can look it up for yourself. So that meant that they weren't just being homosexual. And that meant that they were teaching future generations how to be as sexually perverse as they were. That became a problem. Disease was running rampant. And they didn't have medical cures like they do today. So God, in the hopes of making sure that the entire human race wasn't wiped out by sexual diseases that were coming out of Sodom and Gomorrah, he finally got up there and he just pummeled the whole town with fire, fireballs, basically. He burnt the towns to the ground. He said, you can't behave yourself? I can make you behave. Now then, what does that mean for us? God didn't send a human army to wipe out Sodom and Gomorrah. He did it himself. So why are we Christians going around beating the tar out of homosexuals and even transsexuals? What? Are we trying to send a message to everybody that God can't take care of his own affairs? That we have to take care of him because God can't? That's a horrible message to send. God can take care of his own affairs. Trust me on this. And I'll get into that later. The point of the matter is, Christians are not supposed to be a violent people. We're supposed to be the least violent people. As a matter of fact, we're the ones who are supposed to be picked on, not the other way around. Let me tell you something. St. Paul, in the book of Acts, went into a town and started preaching. The very second he started preaching, the townspeople came out and beat the tar out of him and threw him out. Left him for dead. Did St. Paul go out, find a multi-million man army and charge back in that town and wipe out the entire town? Of course not. He doctored his wounds, dude himself up, took a nice bath, walked back into town and started preaching again. Knowing full well those townspeople would probably beat him up a second time. That's what I'm trying to get to you people. You don't have to stand there and beat up a whole bunch of people to be a Christian. We're the ones supposed to be picked on, not the other way around. We're the victims of other people. That's what makes Christianity very distinctive. So if you're being beat up and run out of town because you're telling everybody what God's word says, well, you're, in a good, you're in good company. God will deal with them in his own way. God has no problem wiping out anybody. But that's God's business, not mine. I'm not God, I'm not trying to be, and I have no intention of trying to be. So, if you if you want to have it have an issue, you have it with God, not with me. Argue with Him. I want no part of it. All right. So anyway, let's keep going here. We now know that God did not make a homosexual partner for Adam. We now know that God stoned Sodom and Gomorrah for a lot of sexual sins. Now, there is not one God-ordained homosexual union in the entire Bible. Let me say that again. There is not one God-ordained homosexual union in the Bible. Not one. God didn't attend any homosexual weddings. It never happened. So, matter of fact, quite the contrary. In Leviticus, chapter 18, verse 22. You shall not lie with a male as with a woman. It is an abomination. God said that. I didn't say that. Joe Blow down the street didn't say that. God said it. Read it for yourself. So, there leads to be a problem. Okay. Now, the first question that's asked of me is, well, gee, you say, well, homosexuals 
they should have the same kind of rights as, as uh, Christians do as long as they never call their unions a marriage. Why would you say such a thing? If you, if you are so devout against homosexuality, why would you stand there and let them have all those rights? The story of Elijah answers that question. Let's go to 1 Kings chapter 18. And I'm going to let you read this for yourself. In this story, and somewhere in chapter 18, it, it starts up where, where Elijah is going to build an altar to God. And the Baal worshippers build an altar to their god, which is Baal. And the story goes like this. The Baal worshippers spend all day trying to get Baal to light up the Baal altar with fire. They fail miserably. And then, Elijah is told by God, I want you to douse my altar with water seven times. Just soak the dang thing. So there would be absolutely no chance that it would light up on its own. Well, Elijah did. Psh. Doused the entire altar built to God with, with uh, water seven times over. And then God set down one of his fireballs and ignited the altar that Elijah had built for God. Well, as soon as that happened, boy, the Baal worshippers were in trouble then. If you want to find out what happened to the Baal worshippers after that, you go ahead and read the Bible. It's not a pretty sight. The thing is, that Jesus himself said the Christians are supposed to be the light of the world. So if we're going to be the light, we need to drag these homosexuals into the light and expose them for who they are. So if they want to have those rights, let them have it. So we can expose them for who they are. We want to bring them out into the open. That's all Christians are to do, is to bring them out to the open. Then people can see for themselves who's more righteous. Let everybody else solve the other problems. Okay? Yeah. We have out now established that... God didn't create a homosexual partner for Adam. He defined marriage himself. Okay. In the Bible. He also went on to say that he did not approve of homosexuality. And you saw what he did about the whole bunch of sexual perverts in Sodom and Gomorrah. And now you know why it is that Christians should use the same strategy as Elijah to expose the homosexual movement. Let them have the rights. We'll bring them out in the open. Now, you say, well, God condones polygamy. No, he doesn't. Nope. He tolerated it, but he didn't He didn't approve of it at all. And if you want a good example of that, read the story of Solomon. Solomon had over 700 wives. You know what happened? They started bringing in their pagan idols. Here he was having 700 wives and a whole slew of pagan idols in his own house, which was an abomination to God. You see, when you start practicing sexuality that is outside the will of God, worse things come along. Well, we condone all the homosexuals. Now we have to condone all the transsexuals and the and the um, people that are practicing polygamy and the people that are practicing bestiality and so on and so forth. And so after after a while, you're condoning every form of sex. And if we've condoned all that, then we have to condone pagan idols. Not this kid. Now let me tell you what God does to pagan idols. There's a little story in 1 Samuel chapter 5 
where the Philistines capture the Ark of God. And, well, it's the Ark of the Covenant. And they take the Ark of the Covenant and they put it right next to their uh, pagan idol. You know what God did? He pushed down the pagan idol. They put it back up, he pushed it down again. Sending a clear-cut signal, you don't compare God's Ark of the Covenant with your idol. Doesn't happen. It's that, it's that clear. Now, a few comments I got. Since Judaism wasn't founded until Abraham and even then it borrowed many of its ceremonies and customs from local pagan traditions. Wrong on both counts. It was God that established Judaism and since God was around longer than Abraham, that Judaism was around longer than Abraham. As a matter of fact, Judaism was established with Eve. Where God said, well, the serpent will bruise your heel, but uh, the woman will, will uh, bruise the head of the serpent. Remember that? It's in here. Don't believe me, you can check it out for yourself. So, now, pagan traditions, the Hebrew people when they were at their peak, did not have a single pagan tradition. Why? Because God established all the traditions in Exodus and Leviticus. They rejected pagan traditions. Now I'm not sure what happened between Abraham and Moses. Once Moses came along, they rejected every form of those pagan traditions. Because God ordered them to. There goes that one. Alright. There are many pagan marriage ceremonies that predate Christian ones. That's true. But God performed the first marriage of Adam and Eve. So I guess God predates all of them. Oh, and let's talk about the language itself. You say, well, I don't, I, the, the marriage term comes from a Latin term. Well, the Latin terms come from Greek terms. And the Greek terms come from the days of the Tower of Babel. Remember Babylon? And guess who controlled all that? God himself. So that answers that one. Okay. Firstly, what is your view on Christians that do believe in same-sex marriages? Got that comment. Well... If God condemned same-sex marriages by first of all making sure that there was no homosexual partner for Adam, by destroying Sodom and Gomorrah, by declaring in Leviticus 18 that people weren't supposed to uh, get in bed with men the same way as they got in bed with women, so on and so forth, that anybody that is contrary to that just doesn't know God very well. It's God's opinion. If you're going to be the pastor of a church, remember this. You're supposed to be teaching what God says in the book. Not your own opinion. Your own opinion don't count in a church. It's only God's opinion that counts in a church. And that's God's opinion. And then I hear about this love, 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 love without righteousness. Remember, if you start condoning homosexuality, you're going to also condone polygamy bestiality and it's going to get worse because you're going to start having idols all through your church. And we all know what God does to idols in your church. He takes them down. You have an idol in your church? Watch out. God will knock it out. Simple as that. And he proved that in um, 1 Samuel chapter 5. So there's your answer on that one. Now, you see, well, what does God do with homosexuals? Okay, remember, God does these things. We don't. And here's the reason why. God is not under the authority of human beings. God's not under that authority. And the thing is, God has a whole army of angels. And none of those angels are under human authority of any kind. So, 
what does God do about homosexuals? Well, God handles things his own way. But there is one, one thing he can do, and he clearly demonstrated this. When God is opposed to somebody, this is the kind of thing that can happen. You know, God was watching over the Israelites one night, and he saw 185,000 Assyrians getting ready to attack him. Did God panic over this? Absolutely not. He declared in the heavens that he wasn't under human authority. He then declared that none of his angels were under human authority either. So he calls an angel. God calls an angel. God didn't go down to the Israelites and say, Hey, look, you're going to face Assyrians tomorrow. You better get ready to go. He didn't do that. Because he knew that his Israelites would probably get hurt and maybe even killed. He didn't want that. So God says, Hey, God calls one of his angels. The angel comes up. God says, Look, around here, none of us are under human authority. God is not under human authority and neither are his angels. So God empowered his angel to go to the 185,000 Assyrians and wipe them out. That's right, that angel killed all 185,000 Assyrians in one night. One angel did that with God's power. So it is well within God's power to wipe out every homosexual on the face of the earth, if that's what he wants to do. It says in the Bible, do not tempt the Lord your God. Now, just because God has the power to wipe out every homosexual on the face of this earth doesn't mean he's going to. That's his decision, not ours. I'm saying he can. And I wouldn't test him to find out. But hey, you go right ahead. But that's your business with God. Has nothing to do with me whatsoever. Hey, you do what you like. I'm out of the picture. I'm just telling you the facts. As a Christian data processor, my only responsibility is to tell you what I know. You take it from there. Hey, whatever you want to do. I had one comment said, well, these people are going to do whatever they like despite what you have to say about it. You're absolutely right. You do whatever you like. But when God comes down on you, don't look at me. That's the way Christians are supposed to operate. We just say, hey, these are the facts. You don't like them. That's your problem. Now, as for that Christian pastor who had the son that, um, I don't know, son, son-in-law, something like that, that uh, was homosexual, he doesn't have to stuff a sermon down that kid's throat. Obviously the kid's not going listen, to listen anyway, so why bother? What he can do is say this, look, if you want to have dinner with me, that's fine, but you're not coming into my house. We'll have at a restaurant, we can have dinner, we can share whatever, but you're not coming in my house anymore. You're not welcome in my house anymore being a homosexual. And if you get into a lot of financial trouble and you end up being on the streets, that's your problem, not my problem. I do care about you, but you're not going to get any assistance from me. The thing with me is, I can still get along with homosexuals as long as I don't do the following things. No, I would not invite a homosexual in my house. Won't do it. Secondly, if somebody's asking for donations for a homosexual charity, I won't give it. Now that's different than if a homosexual comes to me and is wanting donations for a public charity like Relay for Life or uh, the American Heart Association or something like that. For that kind of thing, I would give a donation because that's not run strictly by homosexuals. Okay? It's not strictly benefiting homosexuals. But if it's a charity that 
is benefiting only homosexuals, I won't give to it. Period. See, there is a difference between a homosexual representing a public charity and a homosexual charity. Okay. See the difference? If a homosexual comes out knocking on your door and says, Hey, I want you to donate to the American Cancer Society. Go ahead and donate. Feel no problem with that. But if they come to your door and say, Hey, this is for the Homosexual College Fund. Don't donate to it. Another thing is that you don't go to gay pride parades. If you're scheduled to go to Disneyland or Walt Disney World and they're hosting a gay pride parade during the time you're supposed to be there, don't go. It's not that you can't go to Disneyland or Walt Disney World. Just don't go there when they're having a gay pride parade. Don't get involved with it. Don't be anywhere near it. That establishes your distinction without making a hostile scene. See the difference? Like I said, you can be opposed to homosexuality all you want to be as long as you don't get violent about it. Don't demean people. Don't tear them down. Just state the simple facts. This is what God's Word said. I agree with it. And be done with it. You don't have to make a big scene. Do you think this video made a big scene? No. I told you what can happen. You do whatever you like. I'm not going to interfere. But, the one thing I don't want is for some homosexual group to force me to call their unions a marriage. That will never happen. I will not call their unions a marriage. It is not a marriage. I don't consider it a marriage. End of story. Like I said, I have no problem with them having the rights, but I will not stand here and let you redefine the entire dictionary. We'll, we'll publish our own dictionaries. And believe me, if a Christian publishes a dictionary, it ain't going to have the word, hey, um, marriage is, is like a homosexual. It, it, just won't, it won't be. It will not happen. You can't change words in a dictionary without our permission. Because we will object. To a Christian, a marriage is nothing more than a union between a man and a woman. Simple as that. If the homosexuals don't like it, that's too bad. We want to be distinctive and that's the way it is. But like I said, distinctive doesn't mean mean. We don't, we're not here to be mean. We're just here to be distinctive. And hopefully that cleared up a lot of stuff. Like I said earlier in the video, I just don't like covering topics like this. It's just... Um, there are times when I feel I have to stand up and be counted, but... Normally, that's not my tradition here on YouTube. I'm, I'm not a Bible scholar. I'm not a priest. I'm not a rabbi. I'm not anything. I'm just a Christian data processor telling you what I know. Well, I think I've covered pretty much this entire topic. I will say this as one, one extra footnote. Have you ever noticed that after 4,000 years that nobody has found a way to create a new baby except through a sperm and an egg. You know, the homosexuals can talk about the relationships all they want. That they have yet to find a way to create a baby without a sperm and an egg. So last, last on you. Think about that. And Christians are not going to allow homosexuals to adopt their kids. It's not going to happen. So, if you don't want to suddenly worry about... Now keep in mind, in the Old Testament, that was a big thing. If 
families did not have children and grandchildren and so on and so forth they could be left destitute within two to three generations so back then it was a big risk to be homosexual it's bad enough you might get stoned but on the other hand even if you didn't you could be destitute within one to two generations so it was a serious risk to the family if you became homosexual you were not only putting your life at risk, you were putting the life of your entire family at risk too. Think about it. I know that's not how the things run today. But let me tell you something. Back then, despite what some people will tell you, women did not have a whole lot of rights. They just didn't. And they couldn't even choose who they could marry. Back then, the father chose who you married and that was the person you stayed with. So you were under your father's authority as a woman back then until you got married then you were under your husband's authority. So you never were under any other authority than your father or your husband. And that's true. And in some societies it's still true today. Put that in your fact book. Hopefully I didn't bore you guys too much and uh, hopefully um, I didn't confuse you too much. If you have any comments, leave them down here below. I'm sure you will. And uh, I will tell you more in a future video, so stay tuned.